Hello, I'm Dr. Daniel Griffin. And I'm Dixon Dupomier. And today we're going to be discussing female pelvic and vaginal complaints. Right. Which um, I think I'll start by saying this is a significant um, reason for women to seek medical attention. Um, often something that a lot of providers cannot feel um, prepared or comfortable um, to handle. And one of the challenges here is that these can range from very benign, yes. um, things that a woman might just be concerned about, um, to actually um, severe life-threatening um, issues. I feel even more comfortable with this topic since Daniel is not going to ask me whether I've had any of these things or not. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Fortunately, <laughs> I will not, I will not ask. I mean, I don't mean to make light of it. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not um, at all trying to make light of the situation. It's, it's well, obviously very serious. Well, I will say that we can break these down into different, some, some issues might be related to maternal health, um, yes. might be related to childbearing issues. Right. Um, but because of that, we want to have a certain amount that we can handle as our, we'll say, primary care general providers. Um, but you always want to be ready to refer a woman to uh, a specialist right. if you feel like um, this is something that you're not sure about. Yeah. Um, because a woman having a problem that then prevents them from being able to um, have children yep. can be devastating. Emotionally, it can be devastating in a lot of cultural um, contexts as well. Sure. This may be an important part of um, their goals in life. It may be an important part of their role in the family or the community. Yes. Um, so let's let's talk about um, clinical diseases. How might people present? And I okay. hopefully by breaking it down that way, we can start to get comfortable with different different syndromes, different processes. Um, so s some of them you know, may fall under our sexually transmitted infections, just like we, when we discussed this in males having um, certain issues. Um, so they may present with ulcers. Yeah. They may present with discharge. Correct. They may present with pain. Yep. Um, they may come and see the clinician after they've had what they perceive as a high risk encounter. Um, and by high risk, meaning sexually, a high risk sexual sure. encounter. Um, and one of the things um, we discuss is that a woman, just like a man, may have a pathogen, may have an infection without disease. So there may be asymptomatic carriage of certain pathogens. Right. And that's why we use the terminology now, sexually transmitted infections rather than diseases, because we used to, we used to think that it was, oh, only with symptoms. And now we realize that a large percentage of men and women can have can harbor certain pathogens, but without disease, without any symptoms. Exactly. So when we get to diagnosis, not only is the history going to be very helpful in looking at what are they presenting with, what is the syndrome, what is the complaint or the concern, um, but the exam can also help us to really identify the, the focus of the complaints. Indeed. And I, I like to bring that up um, because in certain cultures, it is customary and fine and culturally acceptable for a male to do the exam. In other contexts, it's more appropriate or more acceptable for a female to do the exam. In certain cultures, it might be the opposite, where there might be a bias, where there's a, a lack of trust if it's a woman, or there might uh, be a religious so violation if it's a man. Yeah. So one of the things before you're going to examine a woman in this area it's really important to be aware of what, what's considered appropriate. Um, in almost all contexts, um, men examining women are chaperoned. There's someone there supervising. Um, part of it makes the woman feel more comfortable. Part of it also verifies that nothing, you know, uncomfortable is, or inappropriate might be happening during the exam. So, so the whole process here um, adds a whole nother layer, which isn't always present in, um, in medicine. Right. And I think it's really important if you're going to be working in a community, it doesn't matter whether it's your home community or people coming into your home community who have different um, senses of what they're comfortable with, you want to be careful. You want to maintain that physician-patient relationship and not, not step into an area or not act in a way that would be upsetting or perceived as inappropriate. Right. Um, in addition to the exam, um, you want to start breaking this down into, we talked about ulcers. But we talked about discharge. 
but you may actually have lower abdominal pain. You may actually have a presentation where it's pain with sex, dyspareunia. Right. And that may not seem significant to a lot of clinicians, but to point out that that is a really significant part of relationship um, intimacy. And so um, I'm going to tell a story now. Usually you tell the stories, but I will tell one. Please do. <laughs> um, I was taking care of a, um, a woman who had um, a few small, small children. She's in her 30s. This is down a remote area of Central America. And um, she, she had an ovarian cyst. It was benign. Um, it was something we saw on ultrasound. Um, she also had giardia, and it was a fairly chronic infection. But the thing that disturbed her the most was that she was finding it painful to have intercourse. And because of that, she was worried her husband would think she didn't find him attractive. And so the impact on the marital situation and her relationship with her spouse and family sure. was more of a concern for her than, than the diarrhea and then right. her feeling poorly. Right. And so I think it's important to be sensitive to all these issues and Indeed. realize that um, there's a large context and a lot going on here. But now let's break down our different presentations to help us with diagnosis and treatment. So we'll start with vaginal discharge. Now vaginal discharge, you might think similar to urethral or penile discharge, uh, can be caused by some of the same pathogens. So vaginal discharge might be caused by... Trichomonas. Trichomonas, exactly. <laughs> candida. Might be caused by candida. Might um, be caused by... Bac bacterial vaginitis, gonorrhea, or gonorrhea, chlamydia. Syphilis is usually going to be an ulcer, yes. but your, your gonorrhea and chlamydia may give you discharge. Um, a lot of times we're going to do syndrome management here. Okay. So if it's a, a purulent discharge, you're worried about maybe gonorrhea, chlamydia, and maybe trichomonas. Um, sometimes it can be a little difficult to tell. Your, your candida vaginitis, usually it's going to be itchy. You might even see a, a white coating or a white discharge. Your bacterial vaginosis, you may have a, a fishy odor. So this could be a little bit of a challenge. There could be changes in pH, but you need to use narrow spectrum pH paper to distinguish that. So right. um, I'm not always sure that's going to be appropriately employed in these um, contexts. You may have lower abdominal or pelvic pain. Um, and this may be something on exam where you feel tenderness in, um, in, in this area, in the pelvic area. Mm -hmm. And then you start worrying about a couple of things. One, which can be devastating, is ectopic pregnancy. Right. So we always want to be doing pregnancy tests. Right. And um, that would be, again, one of, the, one of the resources you want to have with you when you practice. It's very challenging to treat a young woman with pelvic pain when you don't know their pregnancy status. So that's one of the things I'm gonna say you, you wanna have, you wanna have your ability to do pregnancy tests. Um, when you do the exam, if you're not worried about an ectopic pregnancy, you might be worried about pelvic inflammatory disease. You may also be worried about, um, again, sexually transmitted diseases like gonorrhea and chlamydia causing, causing pelvic pain in this How context. How about an ovarian cyst? An ovarian cyst as well. Okay. Not only might this be something you identify an exam, but you may, sure. there may be a cycle to it. Exactly. The story you may be getting is every month at about this time in my cycle, ah, right. I have this pain. Sure. Wow. We have a few other syndromes. Um, we'll talk about genital ulcers that we mentioned before. So we'll start, we're going to start with painful genital ulcers. Mm -hmm. And painful genital ulcers are usually due to herpes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I almost got it right. <laughs> almost, you came so close. So pain, just like men and women, both would be a painful, often burning described. Okay. There might be sort of okay. vesicles, which then erosions. Um, that, and they usually tend to be smaller and multiple. Those tend to make you think of, syph of uh, herpes simplex virus. You almost tricked ah. me. <laughs> <laughs> our, our ulcer that does not hurt ah. might be syphilis. Okay. And... Um, with syphilis, one of the nice things we've talked about before, drug resistance or not. Not. Or not, yeah. Here we are, and syphilis is still sensitive to our penicillin. That's remarkable. So again, you want to know pregnancy status, because benzathine penicillin is going to be your treatment of choice for all individuals 
The only time when it's okay not to use it is maybe in the non-pregnant context. So a pregnant woman is always gonna get treated with penicillin. Um, we'll even desensitize them if they report an allergy to it. And so our syphilis, we're gonna break down into our acute, our late, and our neuro. So we'll start with maybe a one injection, maybe a one injection times three per week. Um, and then neurosyphilis, we still recommend IV penicillin for two weeks. There are some alternatives, which you can see in our, in our table. We have a few others, chancroids, granuloma inguinale, um, LGV, so lymphogranulum venarium, granuloma venarium, I should work yes. on my pronunciation. I think that's good. <laughs> um, so you want to be thinking about all these different um, possibilities. Lots of them. And as we started off, if you get to the point where you're not sure, maybe there's bleeding, maybe there's a syndrome that you're not certain, maybe the right. person is febrile or appearing septic. Yes. This is a time when you want to realize that this can actually be more serious, more life-threatening, and you may want to look at referring to a specialist or to a higher level of care. Right. So I just thought of one of the most exotic of all of the uh, acquired infections. I would okay. even call it an infection. It's called Kanduru. Okay. And it's caused by a parasitic catfish. And this little catfish is about a quarter of an inch long, and it lives in South American catfish gills. It's actually parasitic to catfish, but it's, it's attracted to a gradient of urea. And catfish secrete urea through their gills. Well, we secrete urea through our urethra. <laughs> okay. So if you're wading in a South American river mm -hmm. where there are these catfish and they're all over. And you're, you have to be peeing. You do. You and have you to be think, actively I peeing. I am in a river that's bigger than the, well, the Amazon, for instance. <laughs> you don't even think twice about that. And you emit a stream of urea as a gradient, these little catfish can pick up that gradient almost instantly, and they swim towards the highest source, which is where it's coming from. It can infect both males or affect both males and females. And when it does, it presents as a block. Okay. It's a block of urea. So I'm slightly horrified now. Oh, have you actually <laughs> done that? <laughs> no, fortunately, I, I always avoid urinating when in the Amazon. Oh, good. <laughs> so. At least in the river. But uh, it's, it's one of the most unusual, I guess, ectoparasites of humans. It's, it's mm -hmm. a multicellular vertebrate that, that, that causes disease Interesting. It, when, when it goes in. Because it has... Um, the fins actually bend back along the body as it goes in, and then they go out, so they can't come back can't out Can't come again. back out. Oh, my gosh. I know. All right. Well, I hope you have enjoyed <laughs> this, and despite that story, I hope you'll be back for more. <laughs> See you again. <laughs>